always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the light side of life. So far we've looked at causes of stress. We've looked at work lack of control and hassles and uplifts. Um, we're now moving on to look at measuring stress and this is a, a very short straightforward section um, largely because we can use a lot of the same studies we've already used as part of causes of stress. So we're going to look at three different techniques for measuring stress. Um, the first one we're going to think about, you can probably guess from the pictures, is physiological. Okay. Um, there are different ways you can physiologically measure stress. Uh, you can measure somebody's blood pressure, the idea being that when they're more stressed, their blood pressure is probably going to rise. You can also look at hormone levels, um, in this case steroids or cortisol levels in urine and saliva. And an example of that is from the Riker and Haslam study. Now, you will have done that as part of your AS course. There is absolutely no reason at all why you can't use a study from your AS course for psychology as an example in the A2 exam okay that is absolutely perfectly acceptable if you wanted to give Riker and Hazam as an example that's absolutely fine obviously the other one that you've looked at more recently is the Gear and Meisel study where they look at galvanic skin response and heart rate obviously they discounted the heart rate monitor in the Gear and Meisel study due to its unreliability um, but you can still use that as an example of a physiological measure now, within each of those different measures, not only do you need to be able to give an example of a study, but you also need to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of each. So let's have a think about those. Um, with the physiological measure, it's obviously got the advantage that it's scientific, it's objective, um, it's, it's relatively easy to analyse the actual results of it. It might be hard to analyse the actual hormones within it, but it's easy to analyse the results and you get nice quantitative data, which means it's easy to make comparisons between different participants. Um, the disadvantages, um, obviously it is quantitative, which has its advantages, but there are disadvantages associated that, with that, particularly when you're thinking about an emotional state, something like stress, maybe you're missing some of that background detail um, and the reasons why and how people are actually feeling. Do they feel stressed just because their urine is showing that they've got a high level of a particular hormone? Um, also, it can be expensive if you're having to perform various scientific tests on things, depending, obviously, measuring people's blood pressure isn't going to be particularly expensive, but if you're looking at having to do hormone analyses, then it might be more expensive. Okay, next measure, um, self-report. This is obviously um, used quite often for various reasons, and we've already looked at stress as a, as a self-report method when we were looking at the CANA study okay and within that we also looked at the life event scale um, so again you can use the same study as your piece of evidence here okay and you could either use the CANA one or you could use the life event study um, so what are the advantages depending on what self-report you actually use it can provide you potentially with qualitative and quantitative data um, it can give you high levels of detail it gives you personal information. It's usually pretty cheap and easy to administer, although you have obviously got to spend the time analysing it. Um, and it can often be the only way of getting that personal detail. You might not be able to get it in any other form. Um, there are disadvantages associated with self-report method, which we've looked at a number of times before. So... It can be time consuming, like I said, either to collect all the data if you've got a large sample and to analyse that data. Um, if you've got qualitative data, it can actually be difficult to analyse in itself. Um, if it's quantitative, then it's generally a lot more straightforward. Um, and you've got the usual things of it's liable to demand characteristics, um, social desirability bias. Uh, you've also got the issues of falsification. Um, that's always going to be the issue when you've got self-report methods being used there. Plus you get the issue of individual differences and the subjectivity. If you're asking them to rate things or to comment on how they're thinking, how they're feeling, um, if you've got a Likert scale in there, two people with the same level of stress are not necessarily going to rate it at the same level on the rating scale. Okay, it's very subjective, um, which can make comparisons more difficult. Okay, um, the final measure that we're looking at is a combined approach where you're using a mixture of physiological and psychological measures um, and the example again is one that we've already looked at in the causes and that's Johansson with the Swedish sawmill um, where he was looking at a physiological measure of stress um, and he was looking at the adrenaline levels in the urine 
and uh, psychological measures where he was looking at self-report where he asked people to rate themselves on scales in terms of various emotional aspects. Um, now, obviously there are, are real advantages to the combined approach. Hopefully you have all the strengths of the individual approaches and get rid of some of the weaknesses. Okay, So it can be useful, as I've said there, for a conclusion section if you're describing measurements because you've got physiological, you've got psychological data. Um, so the reliability can be improved because you can check the self-reports against the biological measures. Do they match up? Do they correlate with each other? Do they therefore provide support for each other and increase the reliability of the data? Okay, so as I mentioned when I was talking about each one, you can refer to the Gear and Meisel study um, when you're thinking about a physiological measure, okay, the galvanic skin response. They obviously did use the heart rate, but it wasn't actually then ultimately used in terms of the results and the conclusions. Um, you can talk about Canna um, when you're thinking about self-report, uh, his measure of hassles and uplifts. You can also talk about the Holmes and Ray study as well, which was um, the major life events. And for a combined measure, you can talk about Johansson, okay, the Swedish saw method, uh, Swedish saw method, sorry, Swedish sawmill, um, with his urine tests and self-report. Um, don't forget, for the physiological, you can even refer to Riker and Haslam if you wanted from the AS. So, that is, in a nutshell, measuring stress. But I want you to think about something in preparation for next lesson. So... You could get a really nice question in relation to measuring stress, or you could get a particularly difficult one. So it's it's possible they could link a question in here about validity. Okay, um, validity is about are we measuring what we say we are measuring. Therefore, they could give you a question like the one illustrated there. Discuss the validity of measurements of stress. What I want you to do before next lesson is not to answer that question fully. I don't want a fully written out essay. I want you to plan that essay. Okay. And so what I want you to bring with you to your lesson next week is a plan of how you would answer that question, which we'll then be discussing in class. Okay. So pretty straightforward. That's the measurements. All done. Always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the line.